Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour back in our Father's Word, Book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah meaning whom God launches forth. And certainly he sent this one to assist Josiah, who was a young king doing a good job, king of Judah. Never forget that Jeremiah is written to the house of Judah, where Isaiah was written to the house of Israel. But naturally, both being family, though they are separate at this time, still both family. He had completed the chapter 1 with the seven things that God is against as far as people are concerned that, that uh, should be worshiping him. And he said, you chase after everything that comes along. You don't listen to me. And, and even as as a female camel is in her time, or a, a wild ass is in her time. Nobody could stop you. So we, with that having been from worshiping falsely, okay, traditions of men. So let's pick it up if we may. Chapter 2, verse 25, a word of wisdom from our Father, verse 25, and it reads, Withhold thy foot from being unshod, and thy throat from thirst. Stop craving those things. But thou saidest, there is no, there is no hope, no, for I have loved strangers, and after them will I go. I can't help myself. I can't stop myself. People that listen to the traditions of men and get caught up. You see, God is using adultery here for idolatry, because he knows you can sense adultery. But idolatry, some people have trouble with because they don't know what they're worshiping. He's saying, be careful, consider it. If it isn't God's word, then you're in trouble, friend, coming out the gate. Verse 26. As the thief is ashamed when he is found, so is the house of Israel ashamed that their kings, their princes, and their priests, and their prophets, why? 26. Saying to a stock. This means a chunk of wood. Thou art my father, and to a stone thou hast brought me forth. For they have turned their back unto me. And not their face, but in the time of their trouble, they will say, Arise and save us. In other words, it seems like when troubled times come, good times flow, hey, they forget about God. They'll chase anything that comes along. They'll build a building and call it a house of worship, but they never quite get, and they, they worship the house more than they do the Word of God. You might say, well, how could that be? Well, they never teach the Word of God chapter by chapter and verse by verse there. So what are, what are you going to call it? Okay, verse 28. And where are, the, and where are thy gods, lowercase, that thou hast made me? Let them arise if they can save thee in the time of thy trouble. For according to the number of their cities are their gods. They got one on every corner. O Judah. In other words, you, you have so many traditions and different religions of places of worship. There's one on every corner. There's one in every different city. It's all different, all confusing. And this is what, you know, when you denominalize, that means to divide. You never want to be divided away from the Word of God. Anytime you do, you're, you're breaking contact and, and you're, you're saying, uh, I get my blessings from some house or I get my blessings from some person. All blessings come from God. What you get from people is not going to help you a great deal. It's what comes from God. That is your gift that is eternal. He, he doesn't play part-time church. He's with you forever, always has been from before 
or is right now and always will be. You can count on it. Verse 29. Wherefore will ye plead with me? Ye all have transgressed against me, saith the Lord. Um, why, where, where have I, God is saying, where have I wronged you? Where, where did I go wrong? And of course, God didn't go wrong. Man goes wrong, not God. Verse 30. In vain, that means in emptiness, empty-headedness, have I smitten your children. In other words, well, this, this being the father in vain, I have smitten them. I've tried to give them some tough love. Doesn't do any good. They re receive no correction. They won't listen. Your own sword hath devoured your prophets like a destroying iron. Your own sword is what? Your tongue. In, it, you, some person comes along directly from God, teaching God's word. You, you destroy them. You talk against them, down them, and uh, and so it is that um, uh, you, you lose then. When you lose contact with our Heavenly Father and His blessings, let me ask you a question. Where are your blessings going to come from? Because all blessings flow from Almighty God. And you see, the point is, you won't have any because they do come from Him. Verse 31, O generation, see ye the word of the Lord. <clears throat> Have I been a wilderness unto Israel, a land of darkness? Wherefore, say my people, we are lords. We will come no more unto thee. We have dominion. We're going to do it our way. We're, we're in charge. We're in control. Do you, do you understand where that's coming from? That's straight from Satan. When people think they don't need God's word, that they can write their own book, they can go their own way, they can make their own way, they don't need God. I'm so intelligent, I've got it all under control then you are really kidding yourself. If you think our Father doesn't notice that, then you're in a heap of hurt, my friend. Because when, when you leave God out of the equation, you're on a slippery slope and it's all going downhill, and you're going to crash. You're going to crash at the bottom. Verse 32. Can a maid forget her ornaments, ornaments and, or a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. Can, can a bride forget what she wore on her wedding day? And, and it just doesn't happen. And, and yet, as important as I am, Father is saying, you have a way of forgetting me. You leave me out of the equation. Verse 33. Why trimmest thou thy way to seek love? Um, Therefore hast thou also taught the wicked ones thy ways. Why, why do you primp and flirt in your wicked ways? You, you, in seeking love and worship, the, what, what this is talking about is, is uh, horatry. He said, the professionals could take a lesson from you. That's what God is saying. I'll say it again. He's saying professionals could learn a lesson from you. And you know something? What we're talking about is idolatry. And what he really means when you get right to the bottom of it, Satan could even begin to learn tricks from you because of your misleading people with your traditions, your quick like a bunny and your hippie hoppity uh, fertility eggs festivals instead of Passover. He says, Satan could just learn from you. Because you leave me, that's to say our Father, out of the equation. Verse 34. Also in thy skirts is found the blood of the souls of the poor innocents. I have not found it by secret search, but upon all these. You see, it, you know, it is one thing to murder a flesh body, to kill a flesh body. But when you destroy a soul, you destroy somebody's eternal life. That is not good. In other words, you are really 
you're flirting with bringing destruction upon innocents that are trying to find truth, trying to find God, and all your traditions do is muddle them up and make them worse sinners than they would have been if they been, had never met you, that stayed away from you. Um, blood of a soul is a very serious thing. You're talking eternal then. Verse 35, yet thou sayest, this is what you say to yourself, because I am innocent, uh, surely his anger shall turn from me. Behold, I will plead with thee, because thou sayest, I have not sinned. Uh, um, I'm going to uh, judge you for what you've actually done. That's what he's saying. That's what the word plead here means. God says, you're going to be judged. We have one judge. It's him. How people, you know, inasmuch as he judges every soul and, and it is the only um, way that one can come to repentance, you can't con him, then to make light of him and to, um, to think you have more control than he does, you're asking for trouble. And certainly, um, uh, uh, so it is. When, when you sin, or when, well, they don't consider it a sin. No, because they're deceived. You know, it's, anytime you have a false religion, then you've deceived the people. Many people don't realize they're even sinning and doing that. Why? They've never covered God's Word chapter by chapter, verse by verse, paying attention to the subject, article, and the facts. Verse 36. Why gaddest thou about so much to change thy way? Right, you flirt uh, or cheapen yourself with everything that comes along. Thou also shalt be ashamed of Egypt as thou was ashamed of Assyria. In other words, you depend on nations to help you, and now you even depend on Egypt. You think they're going to help you? What is God talking about? He wants you to depend upon him. He wants you to depend on God, not man, not nations, but on our Heavenly Father. For we're not lords, we're not in control. He is. He sits on the throne, and everything goes as he desires, not as man does. Verse 37. Yea, thou shalt go forth from him in thine hands upon thine head. That's a shame. Of, that's a sign in the middle of shame. Just being so ashamed, there's no way to out. For the Lord hath rejected thy confidences, and thou shalt not prosper in them. In other words, your way of worship is not going to pay off. It's not going to help people. It's not going to even bring eternal life. Oh, brother, now wait, wait, wait. We cast out demons in his name, and we, we, we baptize in his name. But what did Jesus say to those that worshiped the false Christ? Because they didn't know the difference in the true and the fake. They thought they were going to fly away, and they worshiped him that came first, even though God warned them over and over that the false one was coming first. The false Jesus. And they worship him. How ashamed do you think they're going to be? They're going to be so ashamed they can't even face the true Christ. They are so ashamed. And they even wish for death rather than have to face the true Christ. You see, they were well-meaning Christians supposedly in their innocence. They would never have dreamed of worshiping Satan. Even though God warned you in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, all over John, the false one's coming first, and I expect you as Christians to witness against him. Oh, but they listen to the little house down on the corner that says, you don't have to understand God's word. You're going to fly. Fly all the way to hell if you're not careful, my friend. You do not want that shame upon yourself. You want to be a soldier of Almighty God. You want to stand in those traces, pulling that load of truth and sharing it with people whereby they are not deceived and are not ashamed. 
And as you can tell, our father is not a happy camper with this group. Chapter 3, verse 1. They say, if a man put away his wife, and she go from him, and become another man, shall he return unto her again? Shall not that land be greatly polluted? But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers. Yet return again to me, saith the Lord. You know, uh, this, is, this would have been a very difficult statement at that particular time. But we know now what God was talking about. After Christ was crucified, that means uh, that uh, husband, then he resurrected, and she's free to remarry. She, she is as free as she can be through for forgiveness for any part or sin or anything else. This would disagree with the so-called laws, but be that as it may, if, if you were married to Almighty God, and he is your Savior, and there is no other, you'd better be able to go back to him. Verse 2, Lift up thine eyes unto the high places, and see where thou hast not been men with, in the ways hast thou set for them, as the Arabian in the wilderness, and thou hast polluted the land with thy whoredoms and with thy wickedness. And, and so it is, you... you, you Protest against me? Look at yourself, he's saying. You know, religion is a strange thing, and strange thing, and people would say, well, how, how have we done that? We, we're a good, well, what's the high day of Christianity? It's Passover, of course. Why? Because Christ became our Passover, as it's written in First Chronicles chapter, uh, First Corinthians, rather, chapter five, verse six and seven. And a little scribe changed Passover to Ishtar, a pagan goddess. You know, most people are wise enough to go even to a modern dictionary and look up Ishtar, and check out the manuscripts and see that we're supposed to be worshiping Passover, but what are we doing? Instead of worshiping Almighty God who, through the Son who died on the cross for us to bring forgiveness, have the little children out here carrying little baskets of fertility eggs, which has nothing to do with God's Word. And they wonder, well, where did we go wrong? By not staying with God's Word. He said, you're like an Arabian out there running around with everything that comes along. Instead of sticking with God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Verse 3, Therefore, the showers have been withholden, and there hath been no latter rain. And thou hast a whore's forehead, thou refusest to be ashamed. You, the, the truth of the last days is not coming to you. You see, do you understand what, do you understand what the latter rain is? The early rain sprouts the seed and the crop begins to sprout. But it's got to have that latter rain to produce fruit or it withers, it blasts in the field. God says, if you think I'm going to give you the truth concerning the end times when, when you harlotly around with false religions and teachings that are different than my word and you expect me to bless you, no, your forehead is marked and that forehead is marked inside with the mark of the beast. In other words, they're going to worship that first Messiah. That's a very serious thing. The truth of the last days is so precious, so very important that one should stick with God's word when he sees or she sees the trouble that's going on in this world today. Verse 4, Wilt thou not from this time cry unto me? My father, thou art the guide uh, of my youth. Uh, you, you, we, you should expect God to guide you. Not some man, not some tradition, but the Father that created your soul and has the op uh, opportunity to give you eternal life and to also give you the latter rain. That is to say, the truth of the end times where you're not deceived, you're not ashamed, and you worship the true Father, not some fake. Verse 5, Will he reserve his anger forever? 
Will he keep it to the end? Behold, thou hast spoken and done evil things as thou couldest. In other words, you, you do this sin and this false worship over and over and over again. Expect me? You see, you can't con God. He, he wrote you this letter. It's really quite simple. It explains what you are supposed to be doing in worshiping him, drawing your family. And when you're in that family, family doesn't do that to each other, go chasing off around with sticks and stones and traditions of men that make void this word. That's not family. That's pulling away from the family. Verse 6, the Lord said also unto me in the days of Josiah, the king, he was a pretty good little old king, okay? Hast thou seen that which backsliding Israel hath done? Question. She has gone up upon every high mountain and under every green tree, and there hath played the harlot. She'll believe anything. She'll worship anything. Well, just uh, we have this church of laughter, <laughs> laughing. You laugh and laugh and laugh. For what? What, what, is, what? what does that mean? What do you got to laugh about if you're going to hell? You need God's word, which is substance, direction, guide, uh, and he guides us as a guide should. A loving father that keeps you out of trouble and that blesses you while he's doing it. Verse 7, and I said after she had done all these things, turn thou unto me, but she returned not, and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. Judah knew better. She saw it, and she wouldn't do it either. You know, I, I want you to see how patient our father is. After she had done all those things, he said to her, come on home, please. Read the letter I sent you. Turn back to me and give up all that nonsense. Follow me. Don't follow Satan. Don't follow wickedness. You know what he did then? You hear me reference this verse many times by questions from the congregation. Verse 8, And I saw when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went and played the harlot also. So God is a divorcee. He divorced the house of Israel. This is why that the parable of the, the potter's field is ever, ever, ever so important. It shows you the love of our father. That even after he divorced her, with the blood money of Christ, that 30 pieces of silver, he bought the potter's field where all those broken pots, which means people that have broken down in their lives, sin, fallen short, cast aside his broken party, pottery, then Christ's blood puts it all back together where it's a beautiful, beautiful vase again. A, you know, a, a human being where you have forgiveness and you're free to participate in that new wedding that's coming soon. But... It is true. And many people say, well, if, if they consider divorce as the unpardonable sin, well, you, look what you would be calling Almighty God for. He's a divorcee. He's the one that pardons sin. Verse 9. Don't ever forget that verse. You, you can help people considerably by explaining it. Verse 9, and it came to pass through the lightness of her whoredom that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and with sticks, stocks. That is to say, she made a religion out of everything. She made a religion, he built, I mean, took those stones and sticks and built her a little house on every corner. I call it a church, of all things. In, in that building of stocks and stones, they never quite got around to even learning what the latter rain was or even caring that such a thing existed. 
How precious truth is, beloved, especially in this generation of the fig tree. How precious to absorb that latter rain, to know what happens tomorrow, and not be one of these that flits around in false religions and thinks that you're really doing okay. Verse 10, And yet for all this her treacherous sister Judah hath not turned unto me with her whole heart, but feignly, that means faking it, faking it, saith the Lord. And so she did. <clears throat> it's, that, that is a sad state of affairs. You can't con God. You can't fake worship, true worship, by fakeness. It's not going to happen. God will see to it. So don't, don't ever try it. Okay? You can't play both sides of the fence. You either love him and follow him, or uh, you're in a heap of hurt. Verse 11, And the Lord said unto me, The backsliding Israel hath justified herself more than treacherous Judah. Even, even she, Judah, knew better. That was the king line. Okay? It would be the line through which Christ would come. And certainly, uh, Father, you know, do you, can you imagine for a moment how much this hurt him? He had, he had parted the Red Sea. He had fed the manna in the wilderness for 40 years. He had babied them, coddled them, loved them. And then in their good times, look what they did to him. And, and uh, worshiping good Lord only knows what. And leaving our father out of the picture, and they would say to the we are lords, we can do whatever we want to. Just call it religion, and it's, it sells, okay? Verse 12, Go and proclaim these words toward the north, and say, Return thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, and I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. That's our Father. He's a God of love. He is that. Even after all that is done to him, all you have to do is turn back to him, repent, and God forgives you. What a loving father we have. Um, you know, how many people would do that? If somebody had done you the way Israel and Judah has done our father, in going with other way, uh, worshiping other things, you see, the sin comes when you stop worshiping God and begin worshiping, worshiping traditions or the ways of men that make void God and his word, for God is the word. It's a very serious thing. The, so, you know, you're playing around with a very dangerous thing when you don't take God's word at face value, understanding it, understanding the metaphors, figures of speech, and knowing when God explains something, it's not a metaphor when he says it, but he, that's it. Okay. Verse 13, only acknowledge thine iniquity. That's, that's all. Acknowledge that you've sinned, <clears throat> that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God, and hast scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree. And you have not obeyed my voice, saith the Lord. Um, what, what are you saying here? Ask for forgiveness. It's not too late ever. <clears throat> you can ask for forgiveness, and you know something? Once he forgives, it's erased out of the book of life. It doesn't exist. You're forgiven. He doesn't forgive just parts. When, when you repent totally, he forgives totally. You can count on it. Why? That's, that's our Father. He loves you. He loves you enough to do that. 14, turn or return, O backsliding children, saith the Lord. For I am married unto you. And I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. I will restore you. I will bring you to that place of peace. You see, Zion is where he will establish his heavenly kingdom forever. What did he promise there? 
you return to me and repent, acknowledge what you've done and ask forgiveness, I will forgive you and I will guarantee you eternal life in heaven with me. That's Zion. He'll do that. You, you don't get any more love from, uh, you, you would never get that kind of love from a man. But from our Father, he is ever, ever forgiving. And when he erases something, it's not throwing back up to you the next week. That's not the way God operates. When he forgives you, it's gone. It'll never be brought up to you again. It's forgiven. And that's the love of our Father. And that's his request of you. Come join me in heaven for the eternity, so to speak. Verse 15. And I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. They, they will give you that latter rain. They will explain that word whereby you can understand it. Not a bunch of malarkey and messing around out in the woods and chasing this and chasing that, but understanding God's word chapter by chapter, verse by verse, feeding the real truth and people will come. If you feed them the Word of God, people will come. They, they are starving for truth. And that is a promise from God. If you really, really want to understand the Word of God, He will send pastors. A pastor means He, he manages the pasture where you feed. And food will be brought forth whereby you will have that latter rain and understanding concerning the end times. How precious it is. One more verse, verse 16. And it shall come to pass when you be multiplied and increased in the land. In those days, saith the Lord, they shall say no more the ark of the covenant of the Lord, neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit it, neither shall that be done any more. Our Father is going to guide, direct, and bless. How precious He is. I don't know. Do you want to be fed from that Word, the Word of God? Then He sent you the letter. Read it. Many times Jesus would be asked a big, deep question. He would say, it's written. Haven't you read it? The answer is there all the time. That's what you miss when you don't stick with God's Word but you go with traditions of men. All right, don't miss the next lecture. Bless your hearts. Listen a moment, won't you please? Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the Spirit moves, you got a question, you share it. Would you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We're not going to judge people. Why? God is our judge. If there's any one thing he doesn't need, it's our help in judging. He can use your help in planting seeds and, and doing his bidding as far as ministry is concerned, but don't ever judge. That's, that's uh, strictly our Father's business. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you, and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. Now, you've got a prayer request. You don't need the number. You don't need an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking. He's your father. He's your nearest relative. 
and he does love you. You must have faith in him to know he cares. Uh, even when, when you repent, it's like a new day. And you're like a new person, a new creature with him. That love of his is so magnificent. Don't ever pass that up. But let's go to his throne. Father, around the world we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, Leroy from Illinois. Um, when Pastor concluded 1 Timothy, he then explained how the word speak was in, to be translated. He mentioned a reference to kettles. That, that is a, a ten volume work and naturally most people would not want to buy ten volumes to get one page. But <clears throat> let me say that any, as long as you will spell um, uh, Lain in the Greek alphabet, any Greek lexicon, Greek English lexicon will give you the correct pronunciation or translation of Lelin, which is to chatter babble. And that's what God did not want is women or men or anyone else to babble in his house. He wants the truth. He wants the latter rain. So you, you don't have to buy. A kettle was the um, <clears throat> editor of a 10 volume work, which which is it's a good work if you have need of, of the Greek uh, 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 dictionary that much, but not everybody would. One little book, any uh, lexicon, Greek, English, <coughs> will, uh, will straighten you out on Lalit. It's to chatter, and it's, it's no secret. It's as common as can be to find out any Bible bookstore would probably have one or be able to order one. Robert from Colorado. My fiance Kathy wakes up daily to listen to you, but I now listen as well. Is there a scripture that I can read to help me to stop lying? It's causing a damper on our relationship because she always knows I'm lying, but it's about petty things. Well, you've got a problem all right. Um, that's called false witness, and it's mentioned so many places I won't even give you a scripture because you know better. You know, a real man is always going to stick with the truth, whether it hurts or not. You know, if you start lying about one thing, then you've got to lie about something else, and then something else, and something else, and pretty soon you're living a lie. That's not going to impress your fiancé. She wants the real thing. She wants a man that says what he means and means what he says. So uh, just, just let that uh, settle right into your mind and know God doesn't um, appreciate false witness. It's bad habit. Neva from Nebraska. I, I want to thank you for teaching. I feel that I am a child just learning the truth. I have all my not understanding the Bible and being told lies by men. I thank God every day for you and, and your teaching me. My question is, you say there are three times a year we need to give special thanks. Can you please tell me the dates and when I can find them in the Bible? Well, it's, it's uh, Passover, which is always the 15th day after the spring equinox on the solar calendar. Fifty days later is Pentecost. And then just before the autumn... autumn um, um, uh, the autumn what the vernal uh, um, it's it been there you have fall fellowship okay equinox and it'll get you alright it got me and uh, Francis from Mississippi I just want to know is people going to be cast in the lake of fire uh, in Revelation chapter 20, verse 14. And, um, of course, if, if you do not, after, but un understand this. After the Lord's day, which is a millennium, a thousand years, and they see Christ in person, and even will have an opportunity to repent if they did not have the truth, and and to absolutely Satan's locked away where he has no power through that time. 
then when he is released a short season in that same 20th chapter of Revelation, if someone is dumb enough to follow Satan after that, then they need to be in that lake of fire. All it does is blots them out. We don't have them around anymore, and we don't want them around anymore. David from Washington, where can I get information on the Septuagint? Well, the, the, the Septuagint is the Old Testament in Greek, a Greek translation. The Greek Septuagint um, is the Old Testament from an older set of manuscripts than even the King James was uh, translated from. Many times a scholar, if something isn't quite coming uh, to level, he will go to the Septuagint, possibly, I do this sometimes, because it does come from an older set of manuscripts, take it from the Greek and translate it back to the Hebrew, and maybe you get a little clarity there in a balance of, of something that is very difficult to understand. But uh, to answer your question simply, it's the Old Testament in Greek, the Greek language rather than Hebrew and Aramaic. Barbara from California, can you give me your opinion? My nephew got mixed up with drugs and the wrong people and ended up killing himself at the age of 19. His parents' preacher is telling them that he went to hell. They are having a really hard time of this, and my nephew did leave a note asking God to forgive him, but that he just couldn't uh, take it anymore. Well, you know, you might ask the parents, when did their pastor get to be God? You know, only God can judge somebody to hell. The millennium hadn't even happened yet. How in the world some preacher, would-be preacher, can tell a mother and father that he is judge, jury, final, that he's God? I think I'd quit going to that place. That's deception. You know, once one gets into drugs and things of that nature, a chemical imbalance sets in to where they're not their self anymore many times. That's why we have to leave judgment to God. Only God knows the inner thoughts of man. And again, hell doesn't happen until after the end of the thousand-year reign. That's the lake of fire. And... Um, uh, their preacher has set himself up as God Almighty, and if I were them, I'd quit going there. I wouldn't take that from the man. He's lying to them. Uh, well, you're talking about a pastor there. You got that right. Anytime somebody sets themselves up as a judge, whether somebody's going to heaven or hell, he's, he's asking, taking on a, quite a load and maybe even destroying a family. Linda from South Carolina. Pastors are supposed to build and feed a family, not judge and destroy it. Linda from South Carolina. Is Satan coming in a physical body? His own always has wanted to, and he sure will. He has before. As, as uh, it is written in Job chapter 1, verse 6, Where have you been, God asked him. He said, I've been walking to and fro on the earth. Wouldn't be his first trip. Lori from South Carolina. What does the number 11 mean in biblical numerics? It means disorder. Uh, Jay from Arkansas. Where in the Bible does it say the fallen angels are in prison? In Jude, the little short book of Jude, in the first six verses, it lets you know that they are locked in chains until God gets ready to with, have Michael throw them out, except for four that will be released at a time, and we're coming close to it. It's going to happen before too long. And um, so uh, they, you'll find that they are there, and it will even tell you why they are in chains. They're in chains because they left their first habitation, which is to say they left heaven in angelic bodies and seduced Adam's daughters in, in Genesis chapter 6. Uh, Maureen from Kentucky. What did, Paul, what did Paul make? Did he make the prayer shawl, or did he make tents like they live in? He was a tent maker. Um, and uh, tents it is. But, but let, let the word, as always, clear it up for you. Acts chapter 18, verse 3. Acts chapter 18, verse 3. He lodged with some that were 
tent makers because that was his profession. It's laid out for you. Norma from Tennessee. In Ezekiel, the title Lord is all capitalized, and the title God, the G is capitalized, but not the O-D is not. Is this different differentiation between Jesus and God? No, it's, it's different titles. Uh, God in the Hebrew is usually El, but when you see Lord in the uppercase in the Old Testament, uh, Old Testament I said, it means the word is Yahweh. It is the sacred name in the manuscripts. I'll say it again. When you see L-O-R-D, all in uppercase, caps, it usually means that the name in the manuscripts is Yahweh. Uh, Don and Christy from Ohio. Are the fallen angels in the book of Jude the ones you talk about in the Euphrates? Well, just four of them, okay? Not all of them, just four. Uh, only four will be turned loose at that first initial contact. They will all four be turned loose at the same time. And um, uh, always remember when we talk about the Euphrates, what, what did it signify? This is very important. It was the border between Israel and Babylon. When it dries up, spiritually speaking, it means there is no border between Babylon and Israel. It's all Babylon. Okay? They take it it spills over. It is also the river that um, the Israelites crossed over where they were called Eber or Heber, which means those that crossed the river. What river? The river Euphrates. So they were called Hebrews because of the river Euphrates. And uh, Aaron from Tennessee, should preachers get paid? Should we pay tithes? And what's the difference between a tithe and a love offering? Will we go to hell for not paying tithes? It's not a sin to hell, no. Um, I, I would not think so. I'm not gonna set myself up as judge. We'll have to leave that with the Father. But naturally, um, don't muzzle the ox. You know, a preacher has the right to draw a salary if he is a full-time pastor of a church. Many of us choose through, down through the years to have made our own living and not take a salary from the church. But that, that's an individual thing. Um, it, that's why Paul was a tent maker. He would never take a salary from the church. But, but there's nothing. Don't ever think for a moment there's anything wrong with a preacher drawing a salary. They have to eat like everyone else. The difference between a tithe and a love offering is, is when, when people retire, and they, they have no income other than retirement, then there is no way that uh, they can pay a tenth of their allowance, which is, that's all it is, and still pay their uh, taxes and food and medicine. So then the love offering comes in. It can only be a pittance. And God will accept it as quick as he would a mountain, okay? Because it came from the heart and the mind. Uh, I, I am very, God doesn't send out beggars, and I, I really detest, as you probably, if you've listened to me very long, you know it, people that try to rip off retired people, senior citizens, who know they're approaching the crossing over of the Great Divide. And uh, to try to drop the hint that they can buy their way in, you can't, has nothing to do with it. You always pay your own bills and give a love offering. It's impossible to tithe when it's, it is your uh, allowance. It's not your salary. It's not your income. It's your allowance to sustain you in your old age. So you give a love offering. Uh, quite frank, I don't know. We'll leave it go at that. Doris from Michigan. Once you are saved, do you go to heaven no matter what you do? Someone told me this, but I don't believe it. Well, I'm glad you don't because you're correct and they're not. Once you're saved, you are saved and you're pure. Who does the saving? Christ does. 
And then if you begin to sin without repentance, you fall away from salvation. Christ's salvation didn't fail. Don't try to blame it on him. That's what some people do when they say, i got to get saved again. No, you, you were saved coming out the gate by Christ. If you want to get saved again, that's like re-crucifying him all over again. All you do is you repent and get yourself together. Don't try to blame it on Christ, and then it's forgiven. But you can be saved and do enough sins, you can go to hell. Okay, On Judgment Day, God would decree that because he's always fair. Lisa from Louisiana, please explain Acts chapter 10, verse 45 and 46. Um, uh, this is um, where um, you would um, believe, and I'm, I'm going to have to turn there. I can't quite place Acts 10. That's where the sheet came down, but this has to do with... 10, 45 and 46, and 45 says, And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came to with Peter. This is when Gentiles were cleared on belief, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit, for they had heard them speak with tongues and magnify God, as, as they had on Pentecost Day. So, uh, the whole tenth chapter has to do with um, Peter up on the rooftop and God sending down three sheets, one after the other, of unclean animals, saying, Peter, eat. And he said, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm not supposed to eat scavengers. And then God said, that's okay, I'm not talking about scavengers and eating anyway. I'm talking about don't call Gentiles common or unclean when they believe. Baptize them. Uh, Lester from Tennessee, would you explain the firmament? The firmament was the liquid, the moisture, that surrounded this earth at one time, which would later after the catabo fall and cause huge gorges, the plates to move, and, um, and to allow the earth to be exposed to direct sun and storms and wind and jet streams. When the firmament goes back to its place, the earth is protected again. And that's why heaven will be established in Jerusalem on Mount Zion. Daniel from Georgia, I would like to get some scriptures about demons and running the devil off from a seven-year-old son. Luke chapter 10, verse 19, if you're a believer... God gives you power in Christ's name over all your enemies, all of them. So you anoint your son and order, I mean, don't do it gently, order Satan or anything demonic away from your house and your children. Okay. In Christ's name, you can't do it, Christ does in his name. Uh, Victoria from Montana, what else is going on while the two witnesses are here? They are here for 42 months, right? Well, they would have been for 1,209 days, but it's been shortened. Satan is here 42 moons because he's of the night, okay? But they, they will be here a little better than five months, a few days. And uh, what will be going on, you can read of it in the first few verses of Revelation chapter 11. They are given special powers to accomplish things. And it is much as the wrath of God is being poured out, they kind of can call it and uh, participate. Patty from Georgia. When God was making the races on the sixth day, did he make woman for man like he made Eve for Adam? Of course he did. It's, it's written that he made them male and female. He made all the races, and he liked every one of them. He loved them. Because it states that at the end of the sixth day, he looked and it was good. He loved all the races as they were. And then he rested that seventh day, and then he created in the Hebrew manuscripts, Eth Ha'adam, which is the man Adam, through which, and then created Eve from that one, the helix curve, 
not a rib, the helix curve, DNA, feminine, and through which Christ would come, would be the savior of all those races. God's plan is perfect. Troy, uh, this is why it's written, and it throws many people, Eve is the mother of all living. Why? Because she was the mother in biblical court, the umbilical court of Christ. And you are either in Christ or you are not living eternally. And that's what it means. Troy from California. What exactly is Jacob's pillar? Well, Jacob was going to, to, uh, to uh, uh, on a travel, and he laid his head upon this pillar, and it opened the ladder all the way to heaven, uh, spiritually speaking. And that stone uh, he kept, and it was carried with Israel. It was the rock, in a way, that the water came from. It is the rock that Skota, and all the kings and queens have been, the coronations have taken place over in Europe. When that stone was the stone of scone, Jacob's pillar, was moved to that area. That's history, and so it is. It's a beautiful story. Okay, and I'm out of time. You know what? I love you all because you enjoy studying God's Word chapter by chapter, verse by verse. But most of all, God loves you for it. Hey, makes his day. And when you make God's day, boy, is he going to make yours. You know, he wants you to read the letter that he sent you. He doesn't want you snuffing at it and going off into other directions. Absorb it. Makes his day when you make his. Boy, is he going to make yours. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always, I do mean always, bless you. Now, most important, listen to me, you stay in his word. Every day in his word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, he is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan.
Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. The Ark of the Last Days. What an interesting subject. You know, there will be an ark in the end times. As there was in Noah's day, there was an ark. Will the earth be flooded again with water? No, not at all. But there is a flood coming. And it's a flood that if you're not aboard the ark, then you're in trouble. 